Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Medal of Honor induction ceremony in honor of Command Sergeant Major Benny G. Adkins and Specialist 4 Donald P. Sloat posthumously. Command Sergeant Major Benny G. Adkins and Specialist 4 Donald P. Sloat were awarded our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This afternoon, they will be formally inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Chuck Hagel, the Undersecretary of the Army, the Honorable Brad Carson, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Daniel Allen, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Ray Chandler. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Jesse Neese and the invocation which will be delivered by Chaplain Donald L. Rutherford. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Let us all pray together. God of mercy and truth, today we enshrine two soldiers into the proud narrative of our men and women at arms. We represent the courage and warrior spirit of those we rightly call heroes. Let us not take for granted the foundations of family, of faith and community that produce such men of iron will and steel resolve. But we thank you for their tenacity the wisdom in the midst of chaos and the quick and decisive actions you gave them in the fog and confusion of battle. The actions of these men speak to us across history to remind and challenge us that they were just as we are, with hopes for the present and dreams for the future. But when the trumpets of war called upon them, they placed duty before self and sacrifice before safety. With their lives forever changed, they responded to the sounds of the guns. May their actions remind us that a soldier writes his legacy with actions, not just with words. In your holy compassion and name we pray this day. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today to honor two remarkable, remarkable Americans who exhibited the highest valor during their service in Vietnam. Command Sergeant Major Benny Adkins, who is here today with his wife Mary, his children, and grandchildren, and Specialist for Don Sloat, who lost his life fighting for our country, and who is represented today by his brother William, sisters Kathleen and Karen, and extended family. We welcome you all. We uh, are very proud of you. This whole country is very proud of you. And I think uh, President Obama made that uh, very clear uh, yesterday in the very special recognition at the White House. 
when uh, you were awarded the Medal of Honor, and Doctor, your brother uh, was awarded and you received on his behalf. So thank you and your family. Thank you very much. I'd also like to welcome all of those who are here to acknowledge these uh, two special Americans. Also, those who served in battle with these men. We're very proud of you. We're grateful for your service, what you have done for our country, and what you mean to all of us. You witnessed firsthand courageous actions, certainly the courageous actions of the two we honor today, but you too exhibited tremendous bravery on the battlefield. Last month marked 50 years since the Gulf of Tonkin incident and the escalation of the Vietnam War, a conflict that would affect the lives of millions of Americans, ending tens of thousands of lives of those Americans much too soon and leaving others with visible and invisible wounds of war and leaving far too many selfless warriors without the dignity, the respect, and appreciation they deserved when they all came home. We still have not made things right for many of these Vietnam veterans, but today we have the opportunity to correct the record for two of them. Many of you are familiar with their stories of heroism, which again the President described yesterday at the White House. But they bear repeating. Over the 38 hours that his base camp was under fire, Sergeant Major Atkins repeatedly put himself in harm's way to move his wounded comrades to safety, gather urgently needed supplies, and recover the fallen. He almost single-handedly repelled enemy forces when they launched their main assault, firing all the ammunition left in the camp. And when he missed the evacuation helicopter in an attempt to carry out a wounded soldier, he led the survivors into the jungle and evaded capture for another two days. In doing so, Sergeant Major Adkins displayed a level of bravery that saved many lives and showed the enemy that American soldiers have the will to fight. They have the will to fight until the very last bullet. As he said recently, recalling that experience with understated humility, it was not my day to die. While Sergeant Major Atkins' ordeal spanned days and days, Specialist Sloat's lasted one instant, but it was no less heroic. A grenade rolled toward him, tripped by a fellow soldier while they were on patrol in the Quezon Valley. Specialist Sloat had a split-second choice to make. In less than four months into the tour of duty in Vietnam in not even a year since enlisting in the Army. He made a selfless sacrifice to protect his brothers. Said a rifleman on patrol with him that day, I was only five to eight feet behind Don when the grenade went off. His act saved my life and the life of others. That decision to put the greater good above self, to sacrifice, the one for the many, reflects the core values of our military. At our best, we aspire to the altruism, the dedication, and the bold courage that Specialist Sloat embodied that day. By honoring him and Sergeant Major Adkins on this day, we hope their stories will inspire a new generation of leaders. We honor these two soldiers for the remarkable valor they exhibited on the battlefield for reminding us of the awesome power of the human spirit and for symbolizing the fearless determination of the American soldier. As President Kennedy once said, a nation reveals itself not only by the men it produces, but also by the men it honors, the men it remembers. May God bless these two soldiers, their families, and all the men and women in our armed forces who day in and day out personify the ideals of our great nation. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Undersecretary of the Army. <clears throat> Secretary Hagel, Representatives Lucas and Rogers, General Allen, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, and Mrs. Allen, Sergeant Major of the Army, Chandler, Assistant Secretary Shu, other Assistant Secretaries of the Army who are here, the Medal of Honor recipients, Lieutenant Colonel Ray, Medal of Honor recipient, Major Dix, Medal of Honor recipient, Brian Thacker, military service members, Department of Defense civilians, family and friends, good afternoon. And we are here today to induct Specialist Don Sloat and retired Command Sergeant Major Benny Adkins into the Hall of Heroes. It is now, as Secretary Hagel mentioned, almost 50 years, half a century, since those acts of valor we recognize today. But time has not dimmed the bright glow of these men's bravery, and age has not yet plumbed the full depth of our nation's gratitude. And if today's ceremony is, well, a little belated, it takes nothing away from the inspiration we draw from our two recipients, whose names will join a sacred role, a fraternity forged in fire. Alongside those names we also honor today, if only in silence. It is fitting and of personal interest to me, if perhaps only coincidental, that Command Sergeant Major Adkins and Specialist Sloat have one obvious fact in common in addition to both possessing uncommon valor. Command Sergeant Major Adkins, although he now calls Alabama his home, hails from Warica, Oklahoma, a small town, about 2,000 people today, not far from the Texas border in southwestern Oklahoma. As its name suggests, Warica was originally a Native American community, part of the Apache, Kiowa, and Comanche Indian reservations. Specialist Sloat enlisted from Coweta, Oklahoma, itself part of the historic Creek Indian Tribal Territory, and a community I know well, as it is not far from my own hometown of Claremore, Oklahoma. Coweta is a larger place than Warica, perhaps around 10,000 people today, but was no doubt much smaller back when Specialist Sloth was roaming its playing fields. The Vietnam War would claim eight of Coweta's young men, eight, more per capita than any community in the entire nation. Of course, Command Sergeant Major Adkins and Specialist Sloat do in fact share something more than the mere happen chance of their birthplace. They share something, something we celebrate today, something we label heroism, although such a single word, noble as it is, seems inadequate to capture the rare qualities of such remarkable men. Inadequate, inevitably, and maybe, maybe it is indeed impossible to define such an ineffable thing as heroism and instead, we should only focus on its consequences, which can perhaps be better understood. Perhaps, perhaps we can learn more about heroism by asking not what it is or where it comes from, but what it does. So what did Specialist Sloat and Command Sergeant Major Adkins do? Secretary Hagel discussed this himself, but it is worth repeating here. That when one of his fellow soldiers triggered a grenade booby trap near Hawk Hill Fire Base on that fateful day in 1970, Specialist Sloat, not yet 21 years old, did not run or seemingly even hesitate. Instead, he pulled toward him the rolling grenade, shrouding it with his own long body, shielding three men from certain death, but only at the cost of his own. Command Sergeant Major Adkins had three tours in Vietnam, during the second of which he fought in the jungles of the Ah Shaw Valley, not far from Way City with the 5th Special Forces Group. When his camp was attacked by the enemy in what would become a four-day firefight, Command Sergeant Major Adkins, injured though he already was, manned a mortar position, leaving only to weather enemy fire and dragging his fellow injured soldiers to safety. He braved sniper fire to transport the wounded to the camp dispensary and then to an airstrip for evacuation. He returned to the mortar time and time again, alone manning it until there were no more rounds left to fire and then he continued the fight with his rifle. Carrying a wounded soldier, Command Sergeant Major Adkins was unable to board the last evacuation helicopter, and as Secretary Hagel noted, 
he was left behind, fighting for two days through the jungle until his own rescue came. Eighteen wounds to his body, Command Sergeant Major Adkins is attributed with killing up to 175 of the enemy. So nearly a half century on from the jungles of Vietnam, a war that resonates still, we can see the time-honored but never old-fashioned virtues of the soldier. To remain with the wounded, to never accept defeat, to never quit, to never leave a fallen comrade. And we too see made real the soldier's creed, selfless service, honor, loyalty, duty. These specialists slote and command Sergeant Major Adkins made living in circumstances as difficult as fate could see to contrive. While this recounting of extraordinary deeds, of choices made in a split second, but carrying nothing less than the very weight of eternity, the question, unanswerable as it is, recurs. From where did the values of these soldiers emerge? In what crucible was their character formed? And what brings all of our soldiers, all of them, whether their names are inscribed on the Hall of Heroes or whether their names are instead forgotten by history, what brings them to routinely, as a matter of course, perform so valiantly? Since the six survivors of the Mitchell Raid were awarded the first medals of honor in 1863, citizens from presidents to privates have received the Medal of Honor. The story of the medals recipients come from every imaginable background and from every station in life that this great land maintains. I think of one name on that wall, Corporal Thomas Bennett from Morgantown, West Virginia, not too far from here. He was deeply patriotic, but also deeply religious and opposed on that basis to the killing of others, no matter the reason, no matter the justification. But he did not shirk his duty enlisting as a medic instead, for he saw fierce combat in Vietnam. Tom Bennett would die in the central highlands there, gunned down while pulling five soldiers to safety. And I think of another Oklahoman, one of 20 to receive the Medal of Honor. This one, a sailor, Lieutenant Commander Ernest Evans, a Cherokee Indian from eastern Oklahoma, near Coweta and Claremore. He commanded the USS Johnston at the Leyte Gulf. Confronted with the massive Japanese fleet, Commander Evans chose not to flee, but instead to charge alone into the maw of the Japanese fleet. Outgunned, outnumbered, the USS Johnston did what damage it could, allowing the rest of the American fleet to escape. Even when his ship was dead in the water, Ernest Evans refused to abandon his post until every round of the Johnston had been fired. Even the starbursts, which are like flares, and the sandbag rounds, which are used for practice. It is said, it is said that when the Japanese passed the American survivors floating in the water after the ship had been sunk, they threw them food and water and saluted to them, shouting, Samurai, Samurai. As for Evans, that Oklahoman himself, he was last seen astride the deck of the doomed boat, two fingers ripped off by a Japanese blast, shirtless, his own uniform burned off his body, but very much alive. His body would never be found. So whether from the small Indian towns of Oklahoma, like Warica and Coweta, the coal mines of West Virginia, or from the largest of the American cities, these men, all of them, like those we honor today, had, to use the immortal words of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., hearts that were touched by fire. So what does lead men to act so valiantly? It is indeed, attempt it is indeed tempting to ask how such men are created. But courage of this sort is beyond words, even beyond understanding. And maybe we can be satisfied only with knowing that there exists in some people something so inviolable, something so precious, that they would sacrifice their own lives to protect it, to ensure its continued vitality. Let us call it duty, honor, patriotism, love. Whatever we call it, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful that our country seems to be blessed with an abundance of this scarce breed of person, specialist Sloat and Command Sergeant Major Adkins being two of which we honor today. I would note that we recognize, too, those who loved Specialist Sloat and Command Sergeant Major Adkins and who have sacrificed so much themselves. Mary, Command Sergeant Major Adkins' wife of nearly 59 years, 59 years, is here with us today, along with other family members. She raised the family when the nation called, and her sacrifices are acknowledged here today. Please join me in recognizing Mary.
The three siblings of Specialist Sloat are also present today. Dr. Bill Sloat from Enid, Oklahoma, his sister Karen from Mounds, Oklahoma, and Kathy, who still lives in Kuita. As they would no doubt tell you, with them here in spirit is their mother, Don's mother, Evelyn, who championed for her son that which we acknowledge today, but who passed away before her cause would find vindication. Please join me in recognizing the Sloat family. Would you please stand? To the families of Specialist Sloat and Command Sergeant Major Adkins, you inspire us too. Your steadfastness over the years, your love that transcends place and time, reminds us also that, in the words of one of the greatest of American writers, there does exist a realm above this plane of silent compromise. So today, we honor the heroism of two men, two brave, brave men. But this is not a memorial service, but a charge to continued greatness. Not a coda, but an overture for the work of the Army continues to empower our soldiers abroad, to care with dignity those who have been wounded, to honor our obligations to soldiers um, who have services now honorably completed, to remember those soldiers who paid the ultimate sacrifice, and to ready future soldiers when the nation calls again, for call she will. Shaped by our nation's values and forged by the values of the Army, we will be ready. May God bless those we recognize today and their families. May God bless all those who choose a life of service to this country and who, in the words of the British poet Stephen Spender, left the vivid air signed with their honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Well, it's my distinct honor to share in recognition for these two American heroes. Though delayed for over 40 years, it's essential we celebrate their valorous service and sacrifice to our nation. Yesterday at the White House, these men joined an elite group of Medal of Honor recipients. And today, we induct them into the Hall of Heroes, hallowed ground here in the Pentagon, honoring our bravest warriors. Thank you, Secretary Hagel and Under Secretary Carson, for your inspiring words and for hosting today's induction ceremony. These medals also honor all those who served and died alongside Command Sergeant Major Atkins and Specialist Force Sloat. Those members of Alpha 102, 5th Special Forces, and 3rd Platoon, Company D, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry, 196th Light Infantry Brigade, Americal D Division. All those veterans joining here with us today, please stand to be recognized. And as Secretary Carson mentioned, we are blessed today to have three prior Medal of Honor uh, recipients with us today. And we want to extend a special thanks to you in helping to recognize our two newest recipients, Command Sergeant Major Atkins and Specialist Four Sloat. You honor our nation and inspire us all by your courage, your dedication to the values we all hold dear, and your bond with fellow soldiers. A special welcome to the families who have waited so long to share in the honor of this day. The strength of our soldiers is our families. And in this case, two women in particular stand out as heroes. Mrs. Mary Adkins, Command Sergeant Major's wife of 
58 years, and Mrs. Evelyn Sloat, Specialist for Sloat's mom. Mary Adkins raised a family while her husband fought for her country during three tours in Vietnam. That family is with her here today for this great ceremony. Mary rarely knew when he was leaving, where he was going, or if and when he would return. She dedicated herself in support of her soldier. Evelyn Sloat, in her final two years of life, fought to ensure her son's valorous acts were appropriately recognized. These proud women bore so many burdens for our nation, and I join all Americans in praise for your inspiring example. So today we honor these men and those who fought alongside them, especially their comrades who made the ultimate sacrifice. Five Americans died fighting with Command Sergeant Major Atkins at Camp Ashaw. Today we also honor Raymond Allen, Billy Hall, Owen McCann, Philip Stahl, and James Lawrence Taylor. Specialist Four Sloat as you have heard, came from Coweta, Oklahoma, and this small town lost eight of her sons in Vietnam. A tremendous sacrifice for the citizens of Coweta, and this award honors them, for they raised these valiant pa patriots, and they've stood by their families through the years. So today, we also honor Jimmy Lee Campbell, Billy Carver, Frank Fott, Dallas Perryman, Grover Boston, Philip Sanders, Edgar Pulliam Jr., and Reuben Dykes. Describing his experience in Vietnam, Lieutenant General Harold Moore wrote, we discovered in that depressing, hellish place where death was our constant companion that we loved each other. We killed for each other. We died for each other. And yes, we wept for each other. End of quote. Love of comrades certainly motivates soldiers to fight and commit to one another. And both of these warriors we honor today exemplify this inseparable bond of soldiers who share the hell of combat. Donald Sloat's action on this final day was not an isolated act of courage. In fact, he volunteered for service in early 1969 on the heels of the bloodiest year of the Vietnam War. And just as President Nixon announced Vietnamization as the United States began planning for the war's end. Yet Donald Sloat chose to serve. Specialist Force Sloat was in Vietnam for less than four months. And in that time, earned an Army Commendation Medal with Valor, a Bronze Star with Valor, and, to, and yesterday the Medal of Honor. Indeed, Don was no ordinary soldier. He pulled a grenade into his body in order to save the lives of the rest of his team. He loved his comrades, and Donald Sloat gave his life for his brothers. Don was an extraordinary soldier, and I am humbled to join our nation to honor his service once again here today. Command Sergeant Major Benny Atkins sustained 18 combat wounds on that day in March 1966 in the Oshaw Valley. In his words, someone else was watching over me, not myself. As a Green Beret, Benny earned a Distinguished Service Cross, a Silver Star, Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Cluster and V Device, and three Purple Hearts, and now a Medal of Honor. The story of Command Sergeant Major Atkins' valor may be familiar to us, but it bears reinforcement. After fighting back waves of enemy fighters and evacuating multiple injured soldiers out of the camp, there was no exfil helicopter for his special forces team when ordered to leave Camp Ashaw. Sergeant First Class Atkins led his team evading the enemy, at which point, he claims, he felt safer 
because this group of Green Berets was better at jungle fighting than the indigenous enemy. For all our Green Berets in the room, sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? He fought for nearly four days in a continuous struggle for survival, sustaining 18 combat wounds. Yet, five years later, he returned to Vietnam for his third tour. He loved his comrades, and he loves his country. Command Sergeant Major Atkins was a technical advisor for the movie The Green Berets. And in the words of John Wayne, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. And that is what he did again and again and again throughout his life. John Wayne may, may have depicted heroic action in the movies. Benny Atkins lives the courageous service of a real hero a great professional, day in and day out. Today, at long last, we welcome Command Sergeant Major Benny G. Atkins and Specialist for Donald P. Sloat into the Hall of Heroes. We honor their uncommon valor and their courage in combat. Their commitment to our nation and to their fellow soldiers epitomizes the Army profession. The strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldiers. And the strength of our soldiers is our families. And that's what makes us Army strong. Thank you, and God bless you all. Secretary Hagel, Mr. Carson, Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler, and Dr. Sloat will now join General Allen on stage for the induction ceremony. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Specialist Four Donald P. Sloat distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a machine gunner with Delta Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment, 196th Light Infantry Brigade, Americal Division, during combat operations against an armed enemy in the Republic of Vietnam on January 17, 1970. On that morning, Specialist 4 Sloat Squad was conducting a patrol, serving as a blocking element in support of tanks and armored personnel carriers in the area. As the squad moved up a small hill in file formation, the lead soldier tripped a wire attached to a hand grenade booby trap set up by enemy forces. As a grenade rolled down the hill, Specialist 4 Sloat knelt and picked up the grenade. After initially attempting to throw the grenade, Specialist 4 Sloat realized that detonation was imminent. He then drew the grenade to his body and shielded his squad members from the blast, saving their lives. Specialist 4 Sloat's actions define the ultimate sacrifice of laying down his own life in order to save the lives of his comrades. Specialist 4 Donald P. Sloat's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, Delta Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment, 196th Light Infantry Brigade, Americal Division, and the United States Army. At this time, Secretary Hagel will present the Medal of Honor flag. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry and action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon.
Thank you, Dr. Sloat. Command Sergeant Major Adkins, please join Secretary Hagel, Mr. Carson, General Allen, and Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler on the stage. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Sergeant First Class Benny G. Adkins distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as an intelligence sergeant with Detachment Alpha 102, 5th Special Forces Group, 1st Special Forces, during combat operations against an armed enemy at Camp Asha, Republic of Vietnam from March 9th to 12, 1966. When the camp was attacked by a large North Vietnamese and Viet Cong force in the early morning hours, Sergeant First Class Adkins rushed through intense enemy fire and manned a mortar position continually adjusting fire, despite incurring wounds, as the mortar pit received several direct hits from enemy mortars. Upon learning that several soldiers were wounded near the center of camp, he temporarily turned the mortar over to another soldier, ran through exploding mortar rounds, and dragged several comrades to safety. As the hostile fire subsided, Sergeant First Class Adkins exposed himself to sporadic sniper fire while carrying his wounded comrades to the camp dispensary. When Sergeant First Class Adkins and his group of defenders came under heavy small arms fire from members of the civilian irregular defense group that had defected to fight with the North Vietnamese, he maneuvered outside the camp to evacuate a seriously wounded American and draw fire, all the while successfully covering the rescue. When a resupply airdrop landed outside of the camp perimeter, Sergeant First Class Adkins again moved outside of the camp walls to retrieve the much-needed supplies. During the early morning hours of March 10, 1966, enemy forces launched their main attack, and within two hours, Sergeant First Class Adkins was the only man firing a mortar weapon. When all mortar rounds were expended, Sergeant First Class Adkins began placing effective recoilless rifle fire upon enemy positions. Despite receiving additional wounds from enemy rounds exploding on his position, Sergeant First Class Adkins fought off intense waves of attacking Viet Cong. Sergeant First Class Adkins eliminated numerous insurgents with small arms fire after withdrawing to a communications bunker with several soldiers. Running extremely low on ammunition, he returned to the mortar pit, gathered vital ammunition, and ran through intense fire back to the bunker. After being ordered to evacuate the camp, Sergeant First Class Adkins and a small group of soldiers destroyed all signal equipment and classified documents, dug their way out of the rear of the bunker, and fought their way out of the camp. While carrying a wounded soldier to the extraction point, he learned that the last helicopter had already departed. Sergeant First Class Adkins led the group while evading the enemy until they were rescued by helicopter on March 12, 1966. During the 38-hour battle and 48 hours of escape and evasion, Fighting with mortars, machine guns, recoilless rifles, small arms, and hand grenades, it was estimated that Sergeant First Class Adkins killed between 135 and 175 of the enemy while sustaining 18 different wounds to his body. Sergeant First Class Adkins' extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself. Detachment Alpha, 102nd, 5th Special Forces Group, 1st Special Forces, and the United States Army. At this time, Secretary Hagel will also present the Medal of Honor flag to Command Sergeant Major Atkins.
A plaque will now be unveiled inducting Command Sergeant Major Benny G. Adkins and Specialist 4 Donald P. Sloat posthumously into the Hall of Heroes. Thank you, Secretary Hagel, Mr. Carson, General Allen, Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler, and Dr. Sloat. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bill Sloat, brother of Specialist 4, Donald P. Sloat. Greetings. Secretary of Defense Hagel, Under Secretary Carson, Vice Chief of Staff Allen, Sergeant Major Chandler, distinguished DOD civilian guests, general and flag officers, members of Congress, Gold Star families, my family, ladies and gentlemen, and Command Sergeant Major Atkins, good afternoon. It has been said that the Medal of Honor is not given, but earned. Don Sloat loved his family, friends, community, and country. This is one of the reasons I loved him so much. He was my little brother. Don was born February 6, 1949, in Coweta, Oklahoma. He was a left-handed person in a right-handed world. Attempts were made, unsuccessfully, to convert him to use his right hand by his teachers for about three years. This set the stage for Don to do things this way. He remained left-handed. <laughs> his childhood years included seven schools in four different states. Our dad was in the box factory business. This required us to move frequently. One of the stops along the way was in Geyer Springs, Arkansas. Don made what our family calls a profession of faith and publicly professed his belief in Christ as the Son of God. We were baptized together and he had values from the very beginning. Don was nine and I was 11. We were baptized in a small missionary baptistry. A few years later, in Herculaneum, Missouri, I was called from class to attend to Don for a sprained ankle. An injury from playing softball that day. He loved sports and was quite an athlete. His PE teacher wanted Don to walk it off, but for me, one look at the offset ankle it told me right away it was broken. Indeed, it was so shattered that Don's growth plate was damaged. Doctors feared that the leg would not continue to grow and they wanted to alter the growth plate of his good leg. But as it turned out, all that wasn't necessary. My brother was 5'7 at the time and grew to be six foot four. <laughs> he grew tall, strong, and became quite an athlete, and later, quite a soldier. I fi our final family stop was back in Don's birthplace, Coweta. Here he put his size and strength to good use. 
He played football and basketball. Athletics seemed to be his niche. Later, we did learn that his athleticism would make him well-suited to become a brave soldier. My uncle, Ed Green, says that Don was liked by all and would do anything to help people in difficult times. My sister, Karen, says that Don was noted for being a little ornery. For me, I remember us when we were in high school. I remember being real sick with a high fever. Mom was fussing over me. Don stuck his head in my room and said to me, there's nothing wrong with you. Then he suggested that I run around the block three or four times. <laughs> high school graduation came and college loomed. Don went to Northeastern a and College to play football. This was during the Vietnam War. After juggling academic needs, football practice, and financial difficulties, he and best friend Mark Hatfield decided to volunteer to join the Army. They both made a pack to enlist, but Don did not pass his physical. He had high blood pressure, but he was determined to enter the Army profession he took the physical several times before finally passing with the aid of blood pressure medication. Acceptance to the military came at a time when the draft lottery was in place. His lottery number was 366. What's important to note is that Don's number for the draft never came up. Yet he decided to join the Army anyway. He volunteered. Don completed his basic and advanced individual training at Fort Polk, Louisiana. After a short visit while Don was on leave, Don was assigned to the infantry. He served as a machine gunner to the Republic of Vietnam late September 1969. Don promised our family that he would return. He wrote letters to us frequently, frequently as possible. His letters to mom, almost illegible, were short messages, letting mom know about the beauty of the countryside and that he was safe. Mom's letters always ended with, love, son. Of course, the letters that he sent to me were a little different. The countryside was a place of raging war. Came that fateful day, January 17th, 1970, and subsequent notification to my mother by the Army. I was home that day when my mother was notified that my brother didn't make it. Mom was thinking that Don might es escort another fellow Coeta soldier back home for a proper burial, but that was not the case. That day we learned that Don was one of the fallen. Coeta lost eight men in the same time period during the Vietnam conflict. The number was later revised to nine. Our town of Coweta is said to have lost more sons per capita during the Vietnam War than any other community in America. Whether this is part of national record, it is very personal to me and my family and community. The sacrifice is very real. Don's body arrived in a sealed casket. He was home at last. Initial Army reports stated that Don stepped on a landmine. This report was all that we knew until someone came across a reference on the internet. 35 years later, eyewitness accounts showed a different version. We learned that Don used his body to shield a grenade blast to save his fellow squad members. The newly discovered facts prompted my mother's quest. She began her own investigation. She made it a mission to uncover the story with documentation concerning the events of that day when my brother was killed. Many people assisted mom on her quest. On behalf of my family, thank you for helping find the facts. When President Obama called me to let me know that Don had, that he had approved the Medal of Honor, my first thoughts were about my mom. She died December 24, 2011. I believe that she is present today with us in spirit. 
When I visited the Vietnam Memorial in Enid, Oklahoma, I was overwhelmingly reminded of the thousands who died during the conflict. Tomorrow, I'll visit the National Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. to once again reflect on the nearly 60,000 Americans who died. There are nearly 1,000 from Oklahoma. My brother, of course, is one of them. My mom gave me a very special piece of paper with a charcoal pencil rubbing of Don's name. A family friend had given this to my mom years ago after visiting the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's folded in my Bible as a bookmark for John 15, 13. There it reads, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Squad members were Don's newest family and friends. Today, along with my family, community friends, and some of Don's military brothers, we are here to remember Don's service and sacrifice. He protected his fellow soldiers and defended our country, a reminder that the Medal of Honor is earned and not given. I'll close with a personal note from my mom. She asked me to share this note should this day arrive after her death. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless our military. God bless America. Thank you. Signed, love, mom. My brother Don was a brave soldier whose sacrifice allowed others to pursue their American dream. He loved his family, friends, and country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sloat. Ladies and gentlemen, Command Sergeant Major Benny G. Adkins. Secretary Hagel, Under Secretary Carson, Vice Chief of Staff Allen, Sergeant Major Chandler, distinguished civilian guests, general and flag officers, and my family. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and what a humbling afternoon it is for, for an old uh, Special Forces soldier. We, uh, I would like to state at this time that this Medal of Honor belongs to the other 16 Special Forces soldiers that fought with me. All 16 of those other soldiers were wounded, most multi-wounded, and all were decorated for valor, some extremely high valor, and all, unfortunately, with Purple Hearts. And of the five others that are living at the present time in that uh, battle, it is my pleasure to have four of them here with me today. And I would like for those four to please stand up. On behalf of the other living uh, members of the Special Forces detachments that uh, was present in this battle, I would like to dedicate this Medal of Honor to the five individual Special Forces soldiers that paid the ultimate price. And, uh, Sergeant First Class Raymond Allen, 
Sergeant First Class Jimmy Taylor, Staff Sergeant Billy Hall, Sergeant Owen McCann, and Specialist Five Philip Stahl. They are the real heroes. All that we can say is that the Special Forces training evidently served us well in this. We are, we, uh, we are here today, and because of the valor, and because of the valor in my bro uh, brother's arms, and the sacrifices made for these soldiers, and the sacrifices for our families that were serving the military back home, my family and I, I would like for my family to stand at this time, please. I am a very, very fortunate individual. I have had three great professions in my life, and I'm still a young teenager at 80. <laughs> I was, I had a, a great profession as a soldier, and I thank you. I had a great profession as a teacher, and again, that was a great pleasure. I was fortunate enough to have a great profession as a business person, and that will make your life a little better. <laughs> so with this in mind, and I promised, uh, I'm not like my detachment commander. Now, he stated he's going to make a few words. I'm going to stay with that. I'm going to just have a few words tonight. So uh, again, I thank you and I am a humble individual. Thank you, Command Sergeant Major Atkins. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and join in singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing a song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might and the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done fighting till the battle's won and the army goes rolling along. Then it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For where we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. Ladies and gentlemen, please pause for a moment at your seats to allow the official party to exit the auditorium.
Ladies and gentlemen, please continue to remain at your seats until your row has been released. This concludes today's ceremony. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.